Hey everybody, today we are going to be interviewing Freya. You might know her from the map Suijin from the Gunmetal Update and Moss Rock from the Jungle. Hi Freya! Hi. 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 Uh, so besides Suijin and Moss Rock, what other maps have you created in the past that uh, people might know of? Uh, I have created most recently two Man vs. Machine maps, Sequoia and Tian, which you have might have seen hanging around, especially in this video that Crash hasn't uploaded yet, so if he ever might get around to uploading that. <laughs> um, before that, I made Payload Nari. Um, CP Sulfur is another big one that people definitely might know. Yeah, Sulfur's um, really cool. And going right back, Escarpment was one of my first finished maps. I think that's still played around on some community server somewhere. I'm not entirely sure why, but People might know that one too. Yeah, actually, Escarpment's probably one of the first maps of yours I played because we, we used to play that on the House of Nonconformity, and I always thought it was really cool. And and I, now's a good time to mention that uh, Freya is actually somebody that I look up to as a mapper in the TF2 community. As somebody who I consider one of the best mappers in the community, and she uh -huh. will be she will be modest about it, but I think she's really good, really good environment artist. And the unique maps that she comes with, like Suijin's a really, really cool, unique map with a unique theme. Um, that had its own, like, ja Japan theme, and I know you played a big part in making that. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Well, basically, um, at the time, we were at TF2 Maps working on something. You never saw the light of day called Pacific Pack. Oh, yeah. Um, and that was going to have a bunch of jungle maps actually that was sort of the the theme that we were pushing forward for a like a community update that we were going to make a bunch of maps for and we were going to release this update with a bunch of assets and some finished maps and i was working on a map called tethys at the time which never saw the light of day because it was a terrible map <laughs> and no matter what i tried it could not be any good so i gave up on that one and i started a new one and i went hey it's called the pacific pack Japan is on the Pacific, right? So I started making this Japanese map. And um, we were working on this, and it was just dev textures, and there was nothing really special to it. Um, so I started making models for it, basically, because they're, the Japanese assets that were out there were not really up to the standard that I would have liked for my map. and the few Japanese assets that were out there were made by Iarkum. So I approached him on whether or not he wanted to help work on a J Japanese update with me. And um, he said yes, because he really likes making models. And um, we worked together on that. And I put in what models that I could make. He put in what models he could make. The, f the thing about Suikin is that the stuff that actually defines what it looks like is the Arkham's models. It's not mine. <laughs> he, he, he was the real secret behind that update. Um, he made the roofs and the cherry trees. Which are and, like um, very definitive, like Japan. Which are very definitive, exactly, yes. Um, so, yeah, we, we put that together, we released it. He, um, we, we, st we set out from the start knowing that it was going to be a asset pack that was released to the public um, because we're, we're both mappers and we both really like theme content because at that time I think there was jungle the Heyo jungle um pack from Borneo and maybe the construction probably construction yeah. construction was the only was the only two major asset packs out at the time so we definitely we set out to make another one of those just to expand the theme kits of TF2 I guess and yeah um, and, and those kind of things why... are really cool too like if, if you you give this kind of content to mappers they can work with that theme and combine it with other themes and it's just like a big steroid shot to the mapping community yes definitely um and that's why that you can find stuff in the japan oh, sorry japanese pack the model pack that wasn't actually in switching originally because we we made it like hey mappers might like this that's why like the the door the the moon door frame that's like the the round door frame shape mm -hmm. um some of the the, the temple buttresses, I think they're called, which I giggled at every time. <laughs> but, um, so yeah, we both made some models that weren't actually ended up, didn't end up, ah, sorry, words, didn't end up being used in the map. 
but we thought that other mappers would like. So you release those together, and it was sort of like this. Um, I don't, I would I don't know if I'd say big push, but just we put them out there together. Um, a few other people took it up and made some other maps with it. Um, I think only one was finished, which was PLR Effigy. I don't remember what, what game mode it uses, but it's the tug of war payload that's that uh, Mimus Torres made. Oh, yeah. Japanese themed. And I think that was the only other one at the time before I made Sulfur and TN. And Sulfur's a really cool map, too. I, I really like Sulfur. Yes. Um, actually, before I go go to Sulfur, um, Suijin, I know it gets a lot of flack, especially originally when it was first created, that the massive sight line down the middle. And uh, I know originally it wasn't designed to be Koth. Um, could you tell me about that? Well, when I start, first started making Suijin, um, I took the arena route because, A, I actually like arena, and I know people are going to hate me for saying that, or at least completely disagree with me. <laughs> you know, and I actually quite like arena, and I think it's actually quite a fun game mode. So um, I set out to make an arena map because of that, but also because I sort of felt that you could get away with a lot in arena mode that you couldn't get away with in other game modes, like that sightline, for example. Because when it was an arena map, that sightline wasn't really a problem because people would immediately split up out of spawn. They would, they didn't go straight for the point because the point wasn't the focus of the game mode until like however many minutes in it unlocks. So um, the entire map was sort of made as more of a set of interesting combat arenas rather than a map that was focused around the point. So that sightline across the point didn't really make too much of a difference. I mean, it was there so that if you wanted to, you could go immediately to start shooting the enemy, which is something that most arena maps have. If you notice, like, um, Lumberyard, for example, if you go out of your spawn and go to the, the right or the left, whichever side you're on, um, there's a direct sight line straight across to where the other, other players will be. And what players in the arena like that because they can immediately start shooting at the enemy. Um, so that was that was basically the sightline in the region that did that. But of course, once it became a cough map, that was a terrible idea. And I'm sure you've all seen the news up video where he made made use of that and forced me very quickly to fix it. So, um, so what led you to make make it a cough map originally? Like, if it was an arena map and you liked it, what what led you to decide to make a cough out of it? People ask for it basically because people don't like arena, so they're like, "Hey, is there a cough version of this?" And so after the arena version was released and finished, and it was like an RC3 or something, and I wasn't intending to really touch it again, people were like, hey, why isn't there a cough version of this? So I'm like, yeah, fine, I'll make you one, but I can't promise it'll be any good. So I put it, so I made one, changed it over really quickly, put like two extra doors in the, um, the spawn rooms just to sort of make it so that you weren't funneled out of the spawn, which didn't really work. But anyway, um, <laughs> And I threw that, that up in the workshop, and well, people liked it more, I guess. <laughs> and and, then, and then eventually Valve picked it up and, and put it in the gunmetal update. Exactly. And, like, I, I never did it with any intent or any thoughts that it would be any good to play whatsoever, um, <laughs> which I think is why it plays more like a, like I said before, a, you know, a series of interesting combat arenas rather than a good cough map, and people use it as a sort of mess around map, which I think is Yeah, it's good. a it's a very deathmatchy kind of map, and I think it's it's good uh in that regard and then like if uh, if you're super hyper focused on the control point, um maybe it's not as balanced as some of the other maps, but if you're just having fun and running around and you know shooting, I think it's it's a great map for that. And it, it looks really cool too. Yeah, and I think if people enjoy it for that, then then people can enjoy it for that. I never set out to make a, you know, the next fire ducks. So I'm pretty happy where, where it's come, where it's come about to, even if I know lots of people very vehemently hate it. <laughs> There's always going to be haters though. Um, so moving on to the most recent update, the jungle update, uh, you got the map, uh, Moss Rock in, which are you, originally was white rock. Um, and which originally you... was Kaikoku, which originally was <laughs> 70, a 72 hour map. So yeah, it's, it's, it's been a couple versions, yeah, for sure. <laughs> Renamed four times. 
Um, so what was White Rock originally, or Kikoku? Uh, like, what, what was the theme on that? Um, originally, it was made for the 72-hour contest. I do not remember what year it was. There's been so many of those. Right. Back when it was still a contest, not a jam. Um, and I like to point out that I do like the jam format better. But anyway, um, so I, it, I set out to do that. And at the time, we had the two skill sets contests starting up which was the one where um the idea was that the first half of the contest would be a bunch of people making layouts and then we'd find out who won the layout half of the contest and then there would be a second half of the contest where people would be able to detail the layout from the first half and you mm -hmm. didn't have to detail your own you could detail someone else's but you could also de detail your own if you wanted so i set out to make it quite a generic theme actually um but I was obviously very inspired by Upward with the giant death pit and the bridges and the, the wooden um, supports everywhere and stuff like that. So I I don't remember what I was thinking when I drew up the layout um, other than that I wanted a huge death pit <laughs> and the, I wanted the point to be over a huge death pit and the rest of it sort of evolved from there. Um, that's actually one thing I noticed about your maps is you tend to like find an aspect of TF2 mapping and kind of subvert it. Like Swedians, I know one of the things you, you talked to me about before and it's something we like kind of teased each other about was the clipping on it. You left the, the everything open on top. Like you didn't do the typical uh, closing off all the roofs that you, a lot of other maps would have happen. And it felt like with Moss Rock or White Rock, that you were like, what if I just put this giant death pit in the middle of it <laughs> and put a point over the top of it, which I think was a cool way to like kind of subvert. Usually well, something exactly. that big doesn't work. And for me, um, Upward is one of my favorite maps and the parts of the Upward that I like the most is, you know, that the part at the end of the tunnel where there's that, that health pack and army pack hanging over the side of the death oh, yeah, pit. Yeah. And um, I really like that part as well as the part around the third point where it's the, the wooden structure that curls around on itself. I really like that part. I always, I've always liked that part of the map. So I wanted to do that sort of that sort of gameplay in my map um, as a CP map, not a payload map. Because I think if I had done a payload and done an upward theme, people would have really hated me for it. But anyway. <laughs> um, so when you uh, reskinned it, uh, how long did that take to take it from White Rock and make it Moss Rock? Um, it was actually not too bad. Thankfully, the upward theme, like the buildings and the rocks and that kind of thing, those go really well with jungle. Um, obviously, there was no trees in it, so I spent a lot of time placing trees, and I think I put them in places that are actually quite like quite good towards uh, aiding the gameplay and making it a bit more interesting, like that tree on final that's right in the middle of the entire arena. I really like that one. Um, and I really enjoyed putting that one there because that wasn't there originally and it was just like a rock on the ground um, which sort of closed in that area a lot and I think people prefer it more than White Rock's version. So you'd say um, the, the act of reskinning actually improved the gameplay because you added some of these elements to fit the theme better? I would say so, yes. And I also have grown to like the way Moss Rock looks more than White Rock. And I think it's like it's the prime version of the map now. It's the prime universe of Moss Rock. <laughs> <laughs> gotcha. It is. It does look really cool. I think it's it's a cool map. I'd definitely be proud of it. So. But yeah, the the building, like the, all the buildings and the, the architecture, and the fact that it was you know like a giant death pit and whatnot, and with rocks and cliffs everywhere. I think that that transition really quite easily to jungle. And um, obviously, a lot of it was just what, texture swapping. I had to replace all the rocks because the upward rocks. I mean, the rocks from Upward that came out with the Upward um, theme um, do not have a, like reskins of any other theme, so I had to replace them with sort oh, of yeah. like similar sized, similar shaped rocks from um, what what we had on offer. I used the um, rocks from Enclosure that Alligator made for Enclosure that have the moss on them, um, but they're just reskins of like the ones from uh, Sawmill and. Thunder Mountain and other Alpine maps. That was that was interesting um, because in some places I had to sort of I actually had to sort of change how 
um, like the gameplay around them works um, because like some of the rocks right outside the blue spawn, their specific shape they were before sort of led to you being able to stand in specific places and whatnot. But um, gotcha. I had to change that, which I don't think changed too much in terms of how the map itself plays, and I don't think anyone really noticed. So yeah, I honestly, I I played White Rock a bunch because we had it on on uh, Honk. And uh, I didn't notice too many of the changes, honestly, other than the, the visuals, obviously. But um, So moving on, you recently had uh, two MVM maps uh, that you cranked out ridiculously fast. I saw you, like, developing them, and you kind of they kind of were sort of at the same time developing and getting tested, and then you just, like, polished them up and cranked these maps out. Um, and they ultimately won uh, the MVM contest. Uh, I, f- I forget ex- the exact placement. I remember it was just like ridiculous. You on the top with two maps. <laughs> uh, but you sh- Sequoia, could you tell me about Sequoia those? Was, yeah. Sequoia was best overall, and Tien was best in aesthetics. Um, so yeah, I, I I have always enjoyed MVM as a game mode. So when the contest was announced, whatever it was last year, sometime was it last year? No, it must have been early this year. Um, time gets away from me very quickly when it comes to mapping. It happens. <laughs> um, yeah, I set out to make an MVM map, and I started with TN, and I wanted to make a Japanese town, because similar to why I made Sulphur Japanese themed, because it or, or actually wasn't originally Japanese themed when I started making it, but um, similar to that was that I wanted to create a part of a Japanese theme. Like, Suijin is very much mountain temple kind of thing and there are a lot of things that you can't really put in that that i think are really like uniquely japanese themes um and i created sulfur because i wanted to do sort of like spy tech and modern new japanese themed as well as hot springs because i really like hot springs um and tn was i started I set off to make it as a like a rural town that sort of had that um, aspects of a, a rural town that didn't really fit in Sweden, and I wanted to expand the theme in that way, I guess. So I started making this, and I originally had only one road down the middle, and I knew I wanted the train. I don't know if you've played TN. I actually, um, I, I played people. Sequoia a ton, but I've never gotten a chance to play TN. TN has a train that runs through the middle and runs over robots and blows up tanks if it hits it. And I knew I wanted that from the start because I wanted it to be a bit different. And I it thought does sound Japanese, like a hilarious idea, yeah. <laughs> I thought a Japanese town would be a good fit for that because I don't know if you've been to Japan, but they have trains everywhere. Um, so, yeah, I just sort of set out making this MBM map that had some elements in it that I hadn't seen before that I wanted and had a theme that I really wanted to do. And as I was sort of making it and it was turning into this really long, big map that was sort of, I was sort of starting to struggle with, um, I kept having ideas for an MVM map which wouldn't fit in TN and I really wanted to do them. So I started a new map. <laughs> I don't know if it was a good idea. I guess I mean, clearly it, it worked was. out. Yeah, clearly it worked yeah, out really well. But it was definitely stressful having two maps developed at the same time for the contest. Um, especially considering at the point where I had started making Sequoia, I wanted to move on from TN almost. I'm like, well, you know, I've got this new map with all my new ideas and it was new and exciting. And I wanted to not work on TN basically. So I would have to almost force myself to finish that off and get it polished up. That, that is something um, that I think a lot of mappers struggle with is like it's it's easy to start a project and get excited about it and then the, there's kind of a slog when you get near the end of it to finish it off and to polish it up and you're one of the few mappers who can like really push those things out. Is there anything that you feel like helps you stay motivated with that or is it just really forcing yourself to do it? That's a good question. Um I think the fact that it was a contest really helps and I am notorious from like I may, maybe I don't have this notoriety in the community but I definitely feel that myself I am notorious in myself for getting a map to a point where it's releasable 
and people are enjoying it and then not finishing it up from that. <laughs> like, like Sulphur is still beta 4. I've never released an RC1 version of that map. Oh, wow, that's crazy. In, like, two years that it's been out because I don't think m- many people would mind too much if they kept playing beta 4. There are definitely a few bugs in there that I need to fix, but... Yeah, actually, we like like I said, we've, we've played Sulphur quite a few times on Honk, and uh, I really like it. It's kind of like a Steel-style map. Um, could you talk about the gameplay of that? Because I know it's got like an interesting cap mechanic that I've never really seen before. Oh, so we're moving on to Sulphur now? Okay. Yep. <laughs> yeah, um, Sulphur was for the dynamic CP contest. As you know, I make a lot of maps for the contest, the TF2 maps, because I, like, as I was just saying, I find the contest a good motivator for actually finishing them. Um, I made this for the Dynamic CP contests, and that was a contest where you had to make a CP map of any kind. I believe it was any kind. It could have been 5 CP push, 3 CP, 2 CP attack defense, um, whatnot. Um, But it had to have a dynamic element in it somewhere. So I believe we defined it sort of like capturing one of the points changes fundamentally changes the gameplay of the map somehow yeah some something moving or something getting altered yeah something, yeah something that changed when you capture one of the points so i set out to make a steel map because ste- a steel map is the obvious answer to that that you know guideline of something changing when you capture a point yeah um, for sure plus i also really like steel and i wanted to see more steel maps and i think a, a lot of other people took took that route as well and there were some other good steel maps that came out of that contest um you should definitely go play them um to support the game mode but i did i wanted to do something different because although i do like steel i have a lot of problems with how it functions and the two mate like i sat, actually sat down when i started this contest i sat down and i f- sat in steel in a private server for maybe like four hours just <laughs> writing down notes of stuff that didn't like about steel and i think were like fundamental problems that could be improved because as you know steel is like cited as the most confusing map in df2 and people hate it because they cannot figure out how to get around that map see I, i've and, had a lot of people say that and i i don't know if it's just because i've been playing it so long but i feel i felt like i picked it up really fast and i've never had a problem navigating because it's kind of like a big circle but i guess it's it's well, that, more confusing than a, a typical that, map it's the thing is that when you break it down, it's actually really simple to navigate, but obviously people don't find that very easy. So I, I one, that was one of the things I set out when making Sulphur, was making it easy to navigate. And I did that, I started, to, like, sorry, I um, set out to do that in two main ways, which was making the points very unique from each other, so that they were very memorable from each other, because if you play steel it's like all that kind of deserty industrial theme and um while the points do look different for a brand new player at least i'm because i was remembering what i did when i first started playing this game and first started playing steel was that the points are not memorable from each other and they don't have anything that like really defines them and stands out point point c has you know what does it have it has like some industrial buildings with gray metal and some yellow dirt. What does point B have? <laughs> it has some, well, you know, wooden buildings with wood, woods and brown dirt. And point A is industrial buildings with gray metal and brown dirt. Gotcha. So, yeah, I hadn't thought about it that way, actually. That's, that's a really good point. So I set out with, to make sulfur to make the points significantly different from each other in visuals as well as layout. And the other thing that I noted when looking through steel is that from whatever point you're in the map from any of the points like if you're standing on a point you cannot see any of the other points you could like you're in this self-contained area you can see the roots out of it but you cannot see any of the other points you don't know where you're meant to go to attack except for the signs and the same as if, if you're in point b you cannot see any of the other points if you're in point d especially you cannot see any of the other points so set out to make sulfur originally sulfur was actually a jungle island so sort of like think think what banana bay is that's what sulfur was oh, originally wow. going to be hmm. except and the final point 
um, was meant to be inside a volcano. So I set it out to make this like you were playing around the, the like the coastline of the island with this big volcano in the middle and the, no matter where you were you could always see the volcano and you knew that was your final goal um and that sort of that shape of like the volcano in the middle turned into the castle um bathhouse that is the final point in self and now i can see but, that now yeah so like if you're on any of the points in sulfur you can see the castle like actually like i deliberately left the castle not um like not obscured by any trees or bamboo or anything so that no matter where you're on the map you can always see the castle um and that sort of helps i, I at least i think that was successful in helping players navigate through the map because they always knew where they had to go and like if you can see a castle you can see some doorways under it leading in that general direction then you kind of want to go that way, and that leads the players to the to the final point. You know, I've, I've actually I've played it quite a few times. I've never noticed the fact that I was seeing that in the middle, but I've never really had a hard time navigating it either. So maybe it's one of those like subtle things that you don't know know that you're seeing it, but you're still seeing it enough to guide you. Well, that was the, that was the intention as well. There's actually very few signs on um, sulfur. At least English ones. There's, there's a few. There's a few ones that are in Japanese, but. Um. <laughs> um, so the, I know there's there's an interesting uh, capture mechanic though, uh, too. Could you explain how that right, works? Right. Um, so that was the other thing that I decided I didn't like about Steel was the fact that um, in Steel, you can theoretically capture the E point at any time, but I have almost never seen a team go from like straight from A to capturing E and winning. And maybe they have, and maybe they have in like high level play, but I've never personally seen it. So I wanted to make it that it was more possible for you to basically do that. And um, while, in, while in, at the result, you can't really capture A and go straight to D in Sulphur, you can ignore C almost entirely and still win the game. Whereas I feel in Steel, that, you know, pub at least, if you want to win the final point, you pretty much have to capture everything except maybe the very last D point, um, and that makes a very little change anyway. Yeah. So I and I, I thought it would be more interesting because I had heard complaints from people thinking that um, they didn't like the fact that in Steel you can capture the, like, if you manage to back cap E, there's almost nothing that you can do about it. Um, as a like a player that's defending B or whatever, um, and that's is kind of contrary to what I just said. But I feel that if and like it was less fun for people to have E back capped by a scout while they were defending B, for example, than it was to have a concerted push from the other team to capture E early. And the way Steel is set up is that you can't really get you know, a push from your entire team onto the final point because I mean, only jump classes can get onto the final point for the first few um, versions of the point, if you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah. So I, I made, I decided to make it a cough point in the fact that if you want, I uh, set out to the, the goal that if you wanted to, as blue, you could capture the final point and win by having your entire team work together to hold it. Um, and then it has a, it has, it has a timer on it too, right? So it's yeah, you, have, you, you so capture it and the timer goes down. For anyone who doesn't know, the final point on um, Sulphur is a King of the Hill point. So it works like steel in that you can always capture the final point. Um, but if you do that in Sulphur, you have to hold it for a certain amount of time before you win. And um, the outside point, so like A, B, and C in Sulphur, um, while they also make the point like easier to access, like they do in steel, um, it also reduces the time that you have to hold it. So once you've captured all of them, it's instant. Um, so then it just works like a a regular CP once you've captured all of the outside points. So Which, it yeah, was that's a really like, cool mechanic too. I, I really like how it's. It, I think you you made last a little bit easier to capture, but then there's still this you have to hold it mechanic. So it, it makes more back and forth, I feel like. It, it definitely does. And um, 
I, I don't know if I necessarily succeeded on that because most of the time I see people capture A and B before they go for the final point and if they capture C, they almost always win as blue. Um, so I'm not entirely sure it worked out, but I think it was a good good exploration of the game mode. And yeah, for sure. I think, I think a lot of people, from what I've heard, is a lot of people really like it. So I guess it was to some measure a success. Yeah, I, I, I like I said, I, I really enjoy playing on it. It's probably one of my like favorite designs of yours too so i think it's 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 a map that you should finish and i think you should you should go back and polish that one up and, and yes, finish yes, it up I am. Don't pu- worry. It's push coming. it out cool i finally uh, i finally figured out a fix for that horrible overtime bug as well oh um, cool thanks to, oh, thanks to hydrogen and benoist who uh investigated that for me and like looked into the code and figured out why that interaction was happening so because it was just, it was just like spamming overtime wasn't it like yeah there's this there was a circumstance where um if you got overtime where you own the i think it's when you own the final point and um you're capturing one of the outer points i actually haven't played softly in a while myself so i don't quite remember when it happens um because i haven't even opened the the file in a while because i've been working on everything else um but there is a circumstance you can get where it spams overtime like even worse than the original overtime spam bug um, and it's related to like King of the Hill logic being put into a map um, with other CPs and like you know, set up. Just, just set confused up, like, the hell out of it. <laughs> the entire the entire thing was like so hacked together. Like setup time, apparently, you cannot have a setup time in um, King of the Hill. Yes, you can't show it on the HUD. The King of the Hill time is always show on the HUD. So I had to like fake it by having. Um, the King of the Hill point set to one minute for each team at the same time that the setup was counting down. And as soon as the, the time has hit zero, I set them back to what they're meant to be before any before the teams actually win, um, just so I can show the setup timer on the HUD. <laughs> but, and like half the time, it, like you know how when you have a setup time, there's like a little white outline that says setup underneath the clock on your HUD. Yeah. Um, half the time that doesn't even work. And half the time it does. So I'm not, I have no idea why. But yeah, it's so hacked together. So there you go. Uh, that's kind of one thing, and, too. Um, I noticed, like, new mappers are like, oh, how would I go about making a new game mode? A, a lot of bullshit. That's how you go about making a new game mode. And like, the, the other fun <laughs> fact, which no one has, I don't think anyone has really noticed, at least I've never heard feedback about it, but because the setup in Sulphur is not real setup time, it um, the Uber charge does not charge faster oh. in the setup. So you're, as, as a blue medic, you're ac- actually at a severe disadvantage because you can't charge Uber at three times the normal rate in the setup time. Hmm. Yeah, I, I had, I'd never noticed that, but then again, I don't really play medic a ton, but I, I haven't heard any complaints I, about it either. I even, so I even sent Valve an email asking them if they could help me fix it, and yeah, they didn't really get much help back. So <laughs> I think maybe when I push it towards final, I might email them again and ask them if I if they yeah. can help they can me be out. hit or miss. We'll, we'll Some, see. Sometimes you can we'll get see. lucky. So another map that you made uh, a while back was Anari, and this is actually uh, invasion theme. It was back when we had the uh, Mercs versus Aliens contest, which uh, self plug probed eventually won that contest. Um, but tell me a little bit about Anari. Well, Anari was another map that I started off as a seventy-two hour contest map, and all the good ones. Yes, I, I know. I keep <laughs> saying the exact same thing. Is and I started this map off for a contest. Started this map off for. Yeah, but it was another one I started off for a contest, and um, they actually won the 72 hour contest that it was entered in. Um, just self plug. Um, <laughs> basically, I wanted to make a payload map because I haven't done one of these in a while since Escarpment, I think, and I think I had learned a lot from Escarpment. I also wanted to make a granary theme map because that theme is severely underdone and it's really fun to make. Any of your map is listening, you should go make one because it's really fun. Um, it's it's lot, one I've been planning on making something for too, actually. Super, super large amount of really cool references out there. Like if you just search brain elevators or something, you'll find all this amazingly TFG styled architecture from like the American, I don't know, regions. Um, don't know America very well. <laughs> Midwest, I think. Yeah, actually, I, I live in the Midwest and there's like down the street, there's actually like this, like, uh, I, I believe they do like gravel and rocks and things like that. And they've got these really cool silos and buildings. And I took a bunch of pictures and put it in the, uh, the reference 
uh, yeah, a page on TF2 maps, and uh, they're it, they're, yeah, they're it's everywhere. Nice people. The farm theme is super fun to make because you've got so many awesome references to make from to, to work off of. Um, and by the way, if anyone's listening, when you're detailing your map, pro tip, use references. No one, you should not be ashamed of using references. No one will ham, harp on you for that. Um, it is the best thing to do is use references. And that is how you make a good detailed map. Even if it's another another map as reference, use a reference. Anyway, yeah, I do topic. it. I do it. <laughs> No, so yeah, I, I made it for the semi two hour contest. I wanted to make a payload map, I wanted to make a farm map. Um and it was also at the same time that invasion the well we didn't know it was invasion back then, but the Mercs vs. Aliens contest was starting up. So um I had to put a UFO in it somewhere. Um I don't think I did a very good job of it and that's probably why it didn't end up winning the Mercs vs. Alien contest, or at least, well, I shouldn't say that because I don't think the layout's that great either, but it was, the the, inv- the whole UFO thing was a bit shoehorned in. Yeah, like the, the, one of the requirements for the contest is what, that the finale had to, like, blow up the mothership, and that's why Probed has that, and that's why all the invasion maps has the, the mothership getting blown up. Um, I don't actually but... think that was a requirement, but yeah, it was, like, the obvious um, answer to how to do it. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I think it was just, you had to blow it up somewhere in there, and that was, it was a very conclusionary thing, so. <laughs> I know, uh, okay. I know Valve expressed some interest in it, if you want to touch on that. Yes, yes, so, um, uh, once the contest was over, and we found out that sort of, um, invasion was a thing that was happening, sort of behind the scenes, it wasn't, um, totally confirmed at the time, but, um, the the leads of invasion which are Ronin and Ronin and Bang I think um, they sent off all the contest maps not just the winners all of them off to Valve and I think Valve played them all and um, sort of thought about what they thought would be the best fit for the invasion update and they came back with this list of maps and Anaria was on that list. Um, and I was quite excited at the time because that was before Suijin and before Moss Rock and before I had any other official maps. Um, so naturally, I was very excited. But, yeah, that's um, really big un- news. <laughs> for- unfortunately, due to the circumstances, I had to pull it out um, and stop working on it because of things that were happening at the time. Um, so it didn't really get anywhere. Um, and the version that you see now was sort of the version that it was in. And I don't really... I do want to go back and finish it someday, but I mean it's playable at the moment. Except the only thing is, is that the um, the laser beam of the final point shoots at something in the air that doesn't exist. Because I took the invasion parts out <laughs> after the contest because I didn't think they were a good fit for the map at all. Um, apart from the fact that, like, when you think invasion, you think of like farmland with cornfields and whatnot. So that that was the only that was like actually sort of the reason why I went with the farm theme. As well, yeah, but that's that's what I did with probe because I felt like it, it made sense. The, it didn't the, really, <laughs> it didn't really fit, so I took it out, and I think it's at like beta three or something, and it's just sort of sitting there in limbo, and maybe one day I'll finish it. But um, it's playable, and it's I think it's reasonably fun. Um, maybe not my best map ever, but it's reasonably fun, and the final has a really cool reveal, so definitely go play it. <laughs> um, and I know with probed with uh, invasion, I got a, I got like a handful of like notes feedback from valve did you get the same thing from them i actually didn't i oh. never got any feedback from valve <laughs> well, sorry. i'm sorry i'm sorry but no, that didn't happen i don't actually know what their thoughts were on the map apart from the fact that they were interested in it and uh, that is a bummer because uh what i was going to say is it was actually it helped me out a lot and it was like really cool to have this kind of feedback that's, that's a bummer that you didn't get that i think you told me that before and i forgot <laughs> yeah no, i actually never got any feedback apart from just like one line saying this is the map that we'd be, we'd be interested in so um so moving on from inari there's actually another old map of yours um uh that i want to talk about that actually is one that inspired me and it's kind of funny here uh it's a map called windmill Trainsaw. oh no <laughs> <laughs> okay and uh besides the na- the obvious name this is actually a joke map you made a long time ago that I played, it didn't really take off much, but it gave me the inspiration for what became Trainsaw Laser. So you want to talk about it just a little bit, we can move on from it. Um, 
yeah, basically at the time I was making a King of the Hill map called Windmill, which if you really go searching for it, you can probably find it. I only had like two alphas and it was really bad. Um, but I was making a windmill for it. And I, I, was, I was in the, the TFT maps chat room um, at the time where I was making this windmill. And for some reason, I thought it would be funny if the windmill blades killed people as it swung around. And um, from that from that thought, that windmill blades should kill people, I thought, you know, it went to other map hazards like trains and saws. And then it went to the factors, what if we put them all together? Um, <laughs> A logical like, conclusion, for sure. <laughs> and then I attached the saw blades to the trains and it looked really funny. And then I attached the trains to the windmill blades for some reason and made them swing around. And from that point, from that the point where I had that thought, in 12 hours, I had made windmill train saw. It's sort of like, as you can probably see, it's a really crappy layout. And it's just sort of like <laughs> a couple of buildings thrown together around this idea of having like a completely ridiculous map hazard in the middle. And I remember the and worst, um, the worst part, and I say that, I say it very lovingly, the worst part was the spectator camera attached to one of the trains on the windmill. Oh gosh, yes. I didn't even remember what possessed me to do that, but I thought it was hilarious. And at the time I didn't even know spectator cameras could be parented. Yeah. I I still, to this day, like find excuses to parent spectator cameras in dumb ways because of that. So it's still inspiring me to this day. So that's why I had to bring that one up because it's, it's, it's an old one that not a lot of people know. I guess I did mention it in the video that I talked about when I like talked about train saw laser, but it's it's something that is in the history of maps that's kind of related to my stuff that I think is really cool. And yeah, no, I I really don't know what to say about that map because it went from a stupid idea to a full map in twelve hours, and I've never touched it again. Yeah, that happens. <laughs> okay. Anyway, um, actually, like, how long have you been mapping? Like, uh, have you just only worked with TF two stuff or? Uh, did you do anything before TF2? That's a good, that's a good question. Um, so TF2 I've been mapping for nine years now. I didn't play TF2 right when it came out. I um, started playing a little bit after that, maybe like six months after it first came out. And then I was sort of playing on a friend's computer at the time and I was really enjoying it. So I ordered the orange box, the physical orange box off eBay about a year after TF2's release. Um, I remember stressing because at that time, like Steam DRM was like sort of a new thing. Um, and having the disc didn't mean that you could actually own it um, because you needed the key with it. So I remember stressing about buying it off eBay <laughs> and with it coming with a working CD key because you oh, couldn't yeah, buy yeah. it. At least at least at the time, I didn't think you could buy the physical orange box anywhere in Australia. I had to order it from overseas. Yeah, that sounds sketchy for sure. I'd be, <laughs> I would definitely be concerned. Yeah, so I was playing, I was playing TF2 for maybe a, a couple of months, maybe just playing and like, God, I'm gonna. This is really embarrassing to say, but I mostly played TF2 for, and it was my favorite map at the time. Um, so <laughs> for please, shame. So, yeah. Please don't quote that. Um, hey, I was like, like, how old must I have been? I must have been like 13, 14 at the time. So I was a stupid kid. Stupid kids like two fort. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry for everyone who likes two fort. Um, <laughs> wait, wait, wait. Quote uh, Freya 2017. You're stu- a stupid kid if you like two fort. Uh, that's, no, that's, that's what that's, I said. No, that's, 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 that's what like we got out of it. Fort. Okay, okay, fine. <laughs> um, so... Yeah, basically, I've been playing for a few months, and the natural progression, I guess, I don't know if I can say it's, like, part of my personality or whatever, but the natural progression for any game I play seems to be enjoying the game for a little while, and then figuring out how to make my own stuff for that game. Um, Because before that, I had always played, like, RTSs, like Age of Empires. Um, I think I started with Age of Empires 1, and then to Age of Empires 2 and then Age of Mythology um, and it was with Age of Mythology when that had come out um, god I can't remember when that was it must have been like 2002 or something I don't know don't quote me on that um, 
it was the first ever game that I had saved up my own money to buy. And when I was like, you know, 10 years old, 60 bucks for a game is a lot of money. Yeah, for sure. Um, so it was the first ever game I'd saved up to buy. And I played the shit out of that game. Um, and of course it had a level editor or a map editor, um, I guess you can call, where you could sort of make your own campaigns and scenarios and whatnot. And um, yeah, I just messed around with that and I really enjoyed it. And there was one one thing that I ever released that was, it was all right. It was really small and I don't think you could find it anymore. And please don't go looking for it. Um, and I guess I really enjoyed the fact that people were enjoying what I had made. So after that, sort of the natural progress, like I said, the natural progression for every game I played was playing it for a little while and then figuring out how I could make stuff for that game. And TF2 was like a really big one because the tools that it came with were the same tools that you know, Valve had used to make the maps in the game. You can make like proper maps and that was amazing for me because before then, um, I guess it's not necessarily true, but before then you couldn't, but before then it never felt like anything I made was sort of like real. I no, I, I get you because it's like the, the tools that they give players to kind of like sort of make something versus the actual developer tools. And this was like, I did the same thing. I worked with Age of Empires and I like did like the the little top-down tile kind of thing, and you're, like, just copy-pasting stuff around. Um, mm. but... Well, that's not true, actually, because I think they do actually use that tool to create oh, they? campaigns <laughs> and whatnot in um, Edge of Empires and that. But obviously they had, like, they had the ability to um, craft, like, their own units yeah. and stuff like that. Like, in Age of Empires, like, if you wanted to, like, well, in Age of Mythology, I should say, because I know more about this, but if you wanted to make your own character in Age of Mythology... You had to use one of the units, like you have to use a generic soldier unit or one of the characters from the campaign, like, um, but I can't remember what his, the dude's name was, but you had to use one of the existing characters. Like you couldn't make a custom name and you couldn't do custom stats for the units or anything like that, at least not in the original form. Um, so yeah, it never felt like you could truly make what the developers were making. Um, but of course that was different with TF2 because it felt like... You know, you could make a map that was essentially the same as Two Fort, and I don't know if I could have at the time, being a stupid kid, but <laughs> it was possible. Yeah, like, like I know, like a lot of people uh, have to asked me, like, oh, you know, did you mess around with like Halo Forge and like those kind of things? And I was like, it always felt so limited because you were just like kind of moving these parts around. And even now, like, I'll get something and I'll like look at the tools for it, and it's like, well, in hammer i could just stretch a brush out and i wouldn't have to like mess with this prefab yeah. wall piece and try to get it in place you know and it, it does it, it is something you're working with like these i did uh, before tf2 actually that's that's a good point i forgot about that is before tf2 i did actually um play halo one a lot on pc and um that did have a bit of a custom mapping scene um but you have to use 3ds max to make the bsp oh, yeah. for that for that ma uh, that game and um if anyone here knows 3ds max is like and what bsp geometry means you know how crazy that is to sort of put together <laughs> um today it's today it's a bit more possible but back then you had to basically model the entire map in 3ds max and then you take it into another tool and that tool would be where you place the props and the gameplay entities and that kind of thing um so it was it was and, and for a kid like the thought of um you know either buying 3ds max for however absurd amount it was like four thousand dollars or something back then or um sort of taking the the less than savory routes to do it right. um not really something that i could do it like you know 12 years old so <laughs> especially learning a tool like 3ds max was way over my head at that time um, i'm sure there are kids out there that can do it but not me yeah, I was, um, I but I, 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 there was like there was some like tools uh, out there for Halo that let you like move props. Like if you use the download the tool that let you place all the props and gameplay entities, you could also use that to edit existing maps. So you could sort of like you could turn like campaign levels of Halo 
into a multiplayer map or stuff like that. Um, or like, you know, tweak weapon stats and make like, the rocket launch fire 10,000 rockets at once or stuff like that. And I, I messed around with that quite a lot. And um, I just sort of shared it with my group of friends at school because um, we, we used to play Halo during lunchtime. And that's probably going to age me a lot. Uh, <laughs> Uh, because we were the we were the first uh, year group in our school to get personal laptops, and it was this shitty little thing, um, but it ran Halo with its like sixty four megabyte graphics processor or whatever it was, and like I think it had like a sixty four megabyte hard drive. And you're probably going to go, oh, that's, that seems like a lot, but to me that now that seems like a tiny little thing, but. <laughs> So we messed around with Halo and that. We played our, like my maps and our custom mods in lunchtime and, you know, the nerds at school sitting there playing Halo lunchtime instead of kicking a ball, but whatever. See, uh, now you talk about aging. We did original Xbox. This was my senior year of high school. Original Xbox, Halo 2 uh, in my computer class. We did a LAN party on, like, the last day of school. So <laughs> I'm right there. I understand. <laughs> Um, uh, what's your usual method when you are like designing a layout? Do you do like the top down sketches like a lot of people do, or do you just tend to jump straight in a hammer and start building? Um, it actually depends a lot. Sometimes I do top down sketches and sometimes I don't. I think the maps, the map, the good maps that people like that they think of my best maps are the ones where I did a top down layout for. So that might be an indication um of how i should be doing it but so like moss rock and sulfur and inari um and escarpment i did do a top-down layout for originally um like in i think escarpment was on paper but ever since then i just use photoshop and sketched it out with my graphics tablet um but there are some maps like Tien and Sequoia and um, what else have I made recently? Um, cla- cl- cloud Top. Um, oh, yeah, I forgot about that one. Which was like a little 72-hour contest. Um, stuff like that. I just jump into Hammer and just start throwing down brushes. And it's really a hit or miss process. And a lot of the time, I get nowhere with it. Um, you should see the first iterations of sequoia they are abysmal and i actually don't know if i still have them because i think i deleted them entirely um but a lot of the time it's just sort of throw brushes at hammer and see what sticks yeah i i, I could definitely see that i do that quite often so you were talking about uh deleting a vmf uh, how often would you say you actually like delete an area of your map and remake it or delete work that you've done prior um, well, most of the time, I don't delete uh, anything. This is completely contrary to what I just said, but if the map has already been released and, like, I am changing an A1 to an A2 and I decide I hate an area and I delete it all, what I'll do is I'll actually save a new version of the map and then do it. So everything in between versions I've got, but um, in terms of, like, throwing stuff at Hammer and seeing what sticks, like I just said... Um, if it's before Alpha 1 is even released, I will just completely delete stuff out of the VMF and just try again kind of thing. So most of my like, original terrible ideas that didn't work for existing maps are not there anymore. Um, that said, a lot of the maps that I tried that never got anywhere um, are still there in my maps folder. So like, I've got like... Um, yeah, some like random Japanese named maps because I wanted to make another Japanese map and they didn't stick. And um, I had a bunch of cough maps which didn't get anywhere and those are still there. Um, so I don't usually delete stuff unless I'm replacing it with something else. Gotcha. Um, so I, I always hate it when I get this question. Uh, but where would you say your like inspiration comes from most of the time when you do your designs? Is it like stuff you see around or you just kind of get an idea and go with it or um i think it's definitely comes from like a combination of stuff that i've seen both from games and real life and seeing on the internet and there are some really good 
like uh, Twitters that you can follow, um, like one for for Japan theme specifically. There's one which is like um, at Aesthetics Japan or something, and it just posts pictures of Japanese cities and towns and whatnot, just like every day, and that's really inspiring. And I think Tien was inspired originally by one photo from that Twitter that was just like a photo of a street in Kyoto or something. And I thought that would be really cool for a map. So a lot of the time it comes from me seeing something out there in real life on the internet or in a game, like another game somewhere and thinking it would be really cool to make an area like that in a map. And that, that usually that's how my map start is I think of like a visual area or a feeling that I want to evoke and make that rather than thinking of like a gameplay space and then making that. Um, I know some other people work that way where they think like, it would be really cool if there was a point or structure like this, I don't think like that. So, so you're more, you're, you're detailing feeds your gameplay and so the other way around. Yes, my, my detailing definitely feeds my gameplay rather than the other way around. And a lot of the times that doesn't work and sometimes it creates really unique maps. So there you go. I think it's worked out so far, so. Um, what is your favorite map uh, a custom uh, Valve map and of your own. What are your favorite maps? Uh, are we, for Valve maps, are we considering community maps that have been accepted? Um, yeah, sure. I did ask that question, but I think it's still upwards. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, that's actually my favorite Valve map too. So I really like Upward, um, but I also really like High Pass. If we're going with community maps, that's probably my favorite King of the Hill map is High Pass. That is a really well made map, made by uh, Psy and Bloodhound. Yes. Actually. Um. So for Valve maps, it's probably upward or yeah, probably upward. <laughs> I was gonna say Bad Water maybe, but I have some problems with Bad Water. <laughs> um, I still really like it though. Um, but I think I have the most fun playing Upwards or High Pass. Um, I think Upwards got it just like. It's, I think it's extra good for mappers because not only does it play really well and it looks really cool, but it's like made beautifully and like how it wraps around itself and like it's just it's such a good example of how to make a map. So I think I think mappers probably geek out for upward even more than <laughs> players do. Oh uh, yeah, mappers definitely geek out for it. Listen, I definitely geek out for it because it shows that um, big sight lines are not necessarily a thing that makes your map instantly terrible. Because that map is full of sight lines, yeah. especially the, the opening area, um, a sniper can pretty much see like almost all but one doors in the spawn. And people don't, I think, I guess there are people out there that hate that, but it's still often cited as one of the best maps. So it shows that, you know, snipers don't have to dominate your map and your map design. Yeah, and it works and it plays well. Um... So what would you say for a custom map, a non-official map, what would be one of your favorites? Oh, goodness me. Um, I know, right? There's a lot of options to choose from. I guess, I guess probably the ones that I most enjoy would be ones from mappers that I really respect what they do. Um, I always like to quarry from Eidolon. I don't know if any of you have played it, but I like that one because I think it's a king of the hill map that doesn't do it doesn't adhere to the viaduct formula and i know you like personally and crash have advocated for that but i really enjoy when king of the hill maps manage to work when they don't follow that because oh I yeah think totally the formula, i mean I, I i've played so many maps that go to the viaduct formula it doesn't mean they're bad and i mean obviously viaduct is an extremely popular map and there are other maps out there like lakeside which sort of follows it which is extremely um popular and i really enjoy it. but quarry sort of shows that you don't need to necessarily follow that formula to have a coffee map that works um so that has definitely inspired me that one and i really enjoy playing it and i guess reckoner is one of my favorite other custom maps because obviously fire is an amazing person um and she made reckoner and it's inspired by sulfur so you know I have personal stake in that map. <laughs> um, despite me not liking 5CP that much, it's very fun to play on. Um, I'm saying I'm um a lot because it's really hard to pick uh, custom maps that I enjoy. 
Yeah, being being in the community, being like a staff member on TF2 maps, like we tend to see a lot of them, and it's hard to, I I, I find it's hard to like nail one specific one down. So, I I think that the hardest part is that most of the custom maps that I really enjoy have been turned official at some point as well. Um, not saying that I'm like you know the best judge of quality, but I think that maps maps that are really high quality. That play really well and are really enjoyable often get noticed by Valve, so. Yeah, I'd say that's fair. Um, what would be your favorite among your own? What's, what's like, your baby that you've worked on? Oh, it's a tough question. I think Sulfur is probably my best work um, in terms of sort of um, reaching the point where I want it to be. There are some parts of Sulfur which visually I don't think are the greatest, which makes it not my favorite map that I've made visually. I think maybe Tien or Sequoia, I'll probably take that spot for my favorite in terms of visuals. Um, Sequoia isn't like, it, Sequoia isn't anything special in terms of visuals, but I think it came together really well in terms of creating like, the foresty feel. And I'm really proud of that. Um, but then again, those are both my most recent maps. So maybe that speaks to the fact that, you know, you're developing and getting like, better. <laughs> yeah, um, but no, I, I think probably overall, I think Sulfur is my favorite map that I've created. Um, which seems silly that I haven't worked on it for so long and I haven't finished it off. But I did a lot of things on Sulfur, a lot of things that were sort of out there for me at the time. Um, a lot of like crazy brushwork geometry, like the. Um, the tiles outside of blue spawn heading towards B, those were brushwork at the time. I had to turn them into models, but those were brushwork tiles. And those, this is so crazily off grid. Um, <laughs> like the, the whole castle was really fun to make. And that was a real, like, that's all brushwork as well. So that was really fun to, to do. Um, and obviously, I created sort of like, I don't, well, I wouldn't create the style, but I turned like the style that was inspired heavily by Season from FM Pwn. Or however you say his name, I'm sorry if you're listening. <laughs> no idea. Um, <laughs> the guy from CSGO that makes really amazing looking maps, he made a map called Season, and that was what inspired the visuals of Sulphur. Um, and I wanted to make like a, a spy tech theme that was different from what was out there, um, as well as the fact that it was like everything in terms of the Japanese theme at the time that I couldn't put into Suijin. Um so like the the Zen the rock Zen garden and the hot springs and the spy tech. Um, there's no spy tech in Sweden. So you said uh, you you don't typically like five CP. I noticed like most of your maps aren't symmetrical. Like how do you feel about symmetrical? Like Sweden's the only example that I can really think of off the top of my head of yours. Um, yeah, because um, after I made Suijin and it was symmetrical, it was such a nightmare to work with it, I vowed to never do it again. And of course I did do it again multiple times, but I still remember that as such a pain to work on. Um, I don't know if anyone listening has ever used the Japanese theme for a symmetrical map, but I am so sorry because those roof props hate, hate being mirrored so badly. <laughs> and I had to manually place all the roofs on the other side of Sweden oh. um, because they just, they you couldn't mirror them in any easy way. So I had to manually place them, which is why sometimes they might actually be off by a couple of units. Um, I also think that asymmetry is more fun to map for because you can do a progression in your detailing as well as your layout as you're going along. So if you look at, say, Sulfur, um, we keep going back to that one, but I think it's a great example is that um, as you go throughout the map, the theme changes so much and there's an obvious final point and there's an obvious first point. Um, actually, that's not necessarily true, but you get the idea. Like, there's some the progression same, to it, yeah. Yeah, there's, there's some progression to it. So like in Moss Rock, the first point is, uh, you know, like sort of more of the rickety um area and then the final is like significantly more built up and as you're playing through the map you sort of get the feeling that you're moving towards the red base and 
in symmetrical maps, you can't really do that because obviously it has to be symmetrical. And um, you can do it in the detailing if you really try and make both sides completely different in terms of detail. And two fort, for example, manages to do that quite well, but it doesn't really create a sense of progression. It just sort of Variance. you feel like the, you feel like the entire map is sort of the same area, and rather than you building up, like starting somewhere and moving towards something bigger. So I, I feel that some asymmetrical maps are more fun to make for that reason. And also because, I agree. And also because it's just a pain in the ass to mirror stuff. <laughs> yeah. Um, so the other one, too, is I wanted to kind of touch on uh, you kind of had to deal with a shitty situation in your life not too long ago. It was last year uh, you got diagnosed with cancer. And it kind of knocked you out for a little while. Um, you know, it kind of interrupted your life and you were in the hospital for quite a while. The big question I wanted to ask you about it was, uh, was there a specific workshop comment that you think caused it or was it all of them kind of together that did that to I you? Think it was, <laughs> I, I think it was all of them <laughs> together. Um, just the combination of um, the, the, whole, the whole terribly, terribly poorly thought out comments on the workshop combined <laughs> and gave me cancer. <laughs> you know I had to put that in there. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, you know, that's, that's fine. <laughs> but yeah, is there anything you want to say about it? Uh, it sucks. And don't do it. Don't get cancer. It sucks. <laughs> I will do my best, and, personally. And if you people out there are worrying about health issues and going, mm, uh, maybe I should go to the doctor, maybe I shouldn't, go to the doctor. Because it would have saved me a lot of heartache if I had gone to the doctor. <laughs> Um, you were actually, we were working on a project together, which this, this could be our, our segue to this. Um, that was when I had uh, shore leave and I was doing the gameplay design of it and I was passing it to you for the, uh, the art pass. And I feel so bad because you were waiting on me for so long. And I was like, I just want to keep testing. I want to keep testing. I want to really polish this like alpha out. I want to get it like really ready. And then I finally was like, okay, here it is. And you were like, gone you're like yeah i've got cancer and i'm gonna be out it was like what was it a good 14 weeks you were in the hospital wasn't it uh it was five months between different hospitals um and then after that i wasn't i was out of commission in terms of mapping for quite a while as well and then i when as soon as i got back into it i got back into it hard and made two mvm maps and instead, right. of doing, working on, instead of working on straw leave like i should have but anyway so you, you made your MVM maps, and you are finally, well, your, your current project that I know a whole lot about, uh, would you like to talk about Shore Leave a little bit, and where it currently is at? Currently, very close to being finished. Um, depending on how quick Crash edits this interview, you might see it before this interview comes out. <laughs> right. So, is, in terms of the detailing, it is basically all done. The lighting is almost all done. The remaining thing that needs to be done is optimization, clipping, which is crashes. Those are, those are my jobs. Um, and sort of finishing off the effects in terms of what happens when you win the map. Um, no spoilers. <laughs> um, I personally, I've been like blown away by the detailing on this. Like it, it looks gorgeous. Like every part of this map, uh, the like the detailing you added to it, like you can go anywhere in it and just like take a screenshot and it looks really cool. So I'm really excited to get to show this one off. And I think it's like, I, I may, I might be biased because it's my, my map that I created, but I think it's like some of your best work. And I think it's it come true. Together, it's really definitely, cool. definitely spent the most time detailing this map than any other. I think I'm not just in like chronological time, obviously, because I started it last year. Um, but in terms of like hours put into the, the map file, I think it has been the longest. And that shows in the fact that um, it's the biggest VMF I have on my computer is the BSP at the moment sits at like 500 to 600 megabytes before <laughs> compressed because of all the custom content put into it. Um, not just the frontline pack, but both the frontline team and myself and a few other people have made a lot of extra stuff for it just to sort of bring it bring it out. Um, yeah, and we, we kind of wanted it to be like the showcase for the Frontline Pack, too. So it's we wanted to cram as much of the Frontline Pack as we could into it. And it turns out that's a lot of stuff. 
<laughs> that is a lot of stuff. There's a lot of stuff I haven't actually used that I haven't found a place for. Um, specifically, some of the uh, town assets. Um, like a lot, of, a lot of the window variants aren't used, for example. There's a lot of them, um, though. Because there's, there's a crazy amount of them. Um, I'm trying to think of what else there is. There's, there's some stuff in there that I haven't used. A lot of the war stuff, like the trench assets, I haven't used because obviously there's no trenches in the map. But there's a, a lot of stuff used. And I tried I tried to showcase off as many models as I could. But anyway, we're, we're hoping to have uh, Shore Leave out pretty soon. Uh, this was recorded uh, like mid-November. So you can make fun of me for how long this takes me to edit this, uh, but a, you know maybe month, month and a half tops. We're hopefully everything will be out, and we've got some big plans for it. Um, I'll try to get this interview out well before then, so then this will be a a bit of a hype for it. Uh, but we're really excited for the map, and we're really excited to get it out there. So I'm really excited to be able to move on to something else. <laughs> right? Yeah. As bad as, as that sounds, but once you've worked on the map for that long, it's just yeah, I, t I totally understand. That's like, like I said, like the, the question earlier of how do you stay motivated, and you kind of get to that end where it's just a slog, and you do like you. Been, <laughs> it's been back and forth on shore leave. There's a lot of times where I haven't felt motivated to do anything, and that's part of the reason why it's taken so long. Um, besides the whole cancer thing. Yeah. Right. Um, I know part of it too is uh, you trying to work with my geometry. I'm a lot sloppier, especially like. <laughs> It, it the, the map saw so many iterations and just the way I map is different from the way you map. So <laughs> it's a, a, a huge Honestly, pain that's in the ass. I stopped being a problem so early on because I pretty much deleted everything that you you did. And like, <laughs> not not in terms of like no, deleting your work, but in terms of deleting your actual brushes, there were probably maybe only like half of the brushes um, that were there in the original map are still there. I love the stuff I just remade from scratch. Um, and that's right because uh, you'll feel the same way when you have to optimize my detailing. Yeah, right. Where that's 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 kind of one of the things you learn when you're collaborating on a project. You just start hating the other person. And I got so many angry messages and screenshots of like, "What the hell is this crash? What are you doing to me? Why there is this some, a thing in there, your map?" Let's be honest. There was some things that were really, really weird. Why? There, why there were. You... There were, for sure. And it didn't help. It was like such a long iterative process that I went through and I deleted big chunks and I remade stuff and I changed routes and I like just kind of got sloppy with it as I went and I had some bad habits that I fell back on and then I had to pass it over to you and you're like, you monster. <laughs> but I'm starting, like 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 uh, you said, I'm starting to get it back now because I'm like, what is this off-grid circular building? You were like, eh, sorry, that's the engine, that's, that's the program. That wasn't, yeah, that one wasn't my fault. Let's be honest, that one wasn't my fault. Just the fact that that VMF has been saved so many times, the amount of precision loss. Yeah. So you can check. Did you know you can check how many times a VMF has been saved? Oh, really? No, I did not know that. Yeah. And keep, keep asking, and I'll, I'll look this up real quick. So is that, like, every time you hit Control-S? Every time you hit Control-S and oh, something God. has changed. Oh. If if you do it while nothing has changed, it doesn't change. It doesn't do it. But uh, Shoreleave has been s Control S with a change of five thousand three hundred and sixty three times. <laughs> wow, yeah, that sounds about right. Okay, uh, so moving on past Shoreleave, uh, do you have any tips for uh, beginning mappers who are just fresh starting out, like basically just diving into Hammer? Do you have any advice for them? obviously watch crashes tutorials um well i mean yeah duh. that's that's obvious <laughs> uh don't be afraid to make a map that doesn't necessarily conform to like the viaduct formula or something i know like crashes tutorials specifically explain the viaduct, viaduct formula but um well even even i in my, in my tutorials i say like this is the viaduct formula this is how it works don't just cookie cutter make this like you will the whole idea behind mapping is being creative and coming up with something new so i, I, mean, I, doing, I don't take offense to that at all <laughs> doing that as a first map is perfectly fine but i think a lot of the best maps uh sort of show creators 
this sounds really cheesy, but like show the creator's personality through it. Like a lot of like, you'd be surprised how many times if you go to the TFT Maps community and ask, and if you like show a map, a lot of the times the the, the veteran members will be able to go, oh yeah, that's a crash map. Oh yeah, yeah, that's a fine map. Just by just by looking at the map, um, because of the way it's made and the choices made, and um, don't be afraid to try something that is sort of weird that you know other maps don't necessarily do, and just see if it works. Um, I know specifically my the example I'm thinking of is uh, Idolon has told me before that he thinks that the room in Moss Rock right outside the Boy Forward Spawn is really unique because so many other mappers wouldn't just make a room that big and not put anything in it. Yeah, I, get, I can see that. And it works. Like, I had I never works. really questioned it, but yeah, I can see it's just a big, giant room. And the fact that, like, you know, Moss Rock, again, is the fact that, like, if you want to make a map that's half Death Pit, <laughs> try it and see if it <laughs> works. Um, and don't and okay the other the other main thing that i would give as advice to new mappers is, is something i see so much mistake made so much is that you don't have to listen to every piece of feedback it's there and feedback is great and people you know you shouldn't be angry at people for leaving feedback um unless it's really stupid like on people some of that feedback is really stupid but like if someone says that they don't like the map or they don't like an area that's, you know, you shouldn't get angry at them. But if you really like that area, you don't have to change it. You can't please everyone. And if you really like the area and you really think that that's sort of like, you know, a fundamental thing of your map, then you should do it. Um, going back to Sulphur, a lot of people told me that I should change it back to a, a normal steel map and get rid of the King of the Hill Point mechanic. And I just flat out said no, because that was something that I wanted to be a part of the map and I wanted to have it to set it apart from the others and if I had done that it would have been a very different end product yeah definitely um so that's kind of the advice for new mappers what would you say to people who have made a bunch of maps uh they've they've got a bunch of projects under their belt and they feel like they're just not cutting through to like the next level up uh what do you feel like you see like people making mistakes or what do you what do you think is the best way to like step up your game if you're like kind of an uh, advanced moderate you know level mapper uh visuals visuals obviously um i mean <laughs> it's a bit of bias coming from me but i think visuals are an extremely important part of the map and a lot of mappers don't put as much importance into visuals as i think they should and it will show through as sort of like a map that yeah might be fun to play on but it will never stick in someone's mind um i'm trying i i I am thinking of examples but i don't necessarily want to name them in fears of offending the person right Um, i understand there are some maps that i think are really good layouts but they just look really bad and because of that i don't think they've sort of get got the traction that they that the layout deserves um, in terms of detailing, how to get to the next level of detailing, like I just said, uh, use references, use references, and steal stuff. <laughs> and just steal things. And, and uh, I don't mean, I don't mean <laughs> steal, steal stuff like go to someone else's map, <laughs> decompile it, and copy half the map out. But like, if you've got, you've, you can decompile um, Valve maps, for example. There's a, there's a forum, there's a thread on the TF2 Maps forums. So there's got all the maps that have been officialized the valve and community maps so they're decompiled and you can download them and you can look at them and you can see how other maps did stuff other mappers did stuff and if that comes to the point where like you know this area is lit really interestingly and i want to know how to do that if it comes to the point where you're like you're copying someone's lighting values that's perfectly fine yeah and i think I most should... most of my lighting i copy out of like an old map either it's something i did before or it's like a different project or like, I think actually Stony Ridge, I copy a lot of lighting out of that. And I didn't put the lighting in that originally. That was like one of my partners, but it's got some cool lighting elements. And I just grab them and I change the values and I adjust things, but you can use these basic elements and adjust them how you need them. And I don't think there's anything wrong yeah, with it. Definitely. And um, I think like 
using references is extremely important. And so many people ask me how I do my detailing and I will tell them like at all times when I'm detailing, I will have either another map open, um, probably usually a valve map, but sometimes, sometimes a community map just to see how someone's done something when I'm copying their style. Like when I was, um, making uh moss rock i had some other jungle maps open like um enclosure and i'd have them open i you know can you, ha you can have them open in tf2 or for example when i was um making sequoia i had landfall open because obviously that's it's heavily inspired by landfall so having something to reference um seeing how other people do stuff seeing how real life does stuff is very important having a picture open um if you look at like Surely, for example, I have a folder full of pictures that, that Crash has sent me and I have just collected from everywhere that is like, it's like a 500 megabyte folder of just pictures off the internet of European buildings and, you know, French beaches and pubs and you can pull them from anywhere. Like a lot of the references from Surely have come from the movie Kiki's Delivery Service. Um, so yeah, just use references and use references. That's all I can say. <laughs> gotcha. Is that I, I don't, if, if you ever ask a artist, a, like a, a really good artist, if you ever ask them and they say they do not use references in at least some form, they are lying. Is there uh, any kind of consistency that you try to maintain across all your maps? Is there any like one type of element or method of mapping that you use or method of design that you do that you feel like is something that is like your style or you consistently do? Um, and the obvious, the obvious answer to this is my door frames. The, the door frame, the, like the two by one door frame that is existing in pretty much all of my maps. It's like wood, wood bridge, zero three texture or something like that. That has been copied <laughs> out in and out of every single map I've ever made. And not just because it's, you know, because I can't make it because it's really good to have that consistency there for scaling. Um, door frames are really good. Get, get door frames into your map because they help a lot with scaling. Um, the, the, light, the, the basic lighting, like we touched on this already, but the basic lighting fixture has been copied in and out of every single one of my maps. Um, <laughs> so I think my style is often defined by those, like, those doorways. Um, and those doorways are eight units thick, so all my maps are made on the eight unit grid, which sort of defines my maps as well. Um, yeah, I can see that for sure. In terms of like, like you know, more high level stuff, um, I guess like open areas define my maps a lot. I've never really made a closed in map um, because I don't really enjoy playing them. Uh, it's kind of hard to think. Yeah, I guess just sort of. I'll say I think personally from seeing your style, I kind of mentioned it earlier, but it's like, to me, your style is like subversion of typical tf2 norms so you, yeah, there's, there's I guess, always something I guess, that's a good way to, I guess you can say that um i do often set out with making my maps with like one particular goal that i want to achieve and usually that goal is something that isn't just make another map that does something a bunch of other maps already do um, so often that leads to completely subverting it. So like with uh, Swedish, I set out to make a map that was something that you could explore and something that you weren't confined to, you know, just the game. And I'm saying that, and I don't think, you know, your clipping, for example, <laughs> is bad. And that definitely has a place, but... Um, at the same time, I think people really enjoy the fact that you can hide in trees and you can jump from rocks to trees to roofs to bridges and um, yeah, honestly, can, honestly, you know, it's rocket, something rocket jump up. It's something that like I took as like a, maybe I could relax a little bit on some of these things and like I actually there's there's specifically a roof on probed. Um, that people don't use it a ton, but you can actually one of the buildings right next to the point you can get up on the roof and it's really high up compared to everything else and you wouldn't normally expect to get up there but i just kind of left it open and i think it was partially like well she got away with it so why not so i think it's good it's to experiment with those kind of things i think now that you've said that i think the thing that defines my mapping style is i always ask why why does something have to be this way 
like when it came to sulfur i asked why does steel steel game mode have to be this way you know why do the points have to be laid out in this fashion um why does this roof have to be clipped off you know if, if you're clipping off a roof are you going to make it less fun for the person trying to get up there than the person that's killed by it because a lot of the time when people can get up to roofs like that they have a lot of fun and they they really enjoy the fact that they found this point and then you know getting a couple of picks from standing up there and the person on the other end might care that they got killed by it but then at the same time they go oh that's a really cool spot maybe i can use that in in the future kind of thing that makes Um, sense so it's a lot of the times a lot of the time it's just like why is something this way and can i get away with it not being that way um you know why do people hate death pits can i make a death pit that you know is (laughs) rewarding to to traverse and like in in moss rock there is if you go to the right from blue spawn you don't have to go anywhere near the death pit until we get to the point but if you go you know down through the death pit or next to the death pit it's a lot quicker it's a lot you know there's more health packs and whatnot so yeah i would say i'm I'm pretty similar about like the subversion thing is like mostly like my joke maps especially like train saw laser it's like don't kill players repeatedly because it's frustrating and you know you're taking the control away from them so it's like okay how can i why is that the case what can i do to reduce the penalty for dying you know make a really short respawn uh, how can I make it their fault that they're dying just because they didn't learn the map? So it's like make everything really consistent. Um, and then with like yeah. wub wub wub, it's like don't make a super visually noisy map. Like okay, what if I make a super visually noisy map? How can I make that fun? <laughs> so like I I, I I totally understand that like for sure. And it's kind of yeah, pushing I'm... those boundaries is what makes something new and unique, and you're not it, it makes you stand out more. And that and that definitely like. So asking why definitely extends to other parts as well. Um, I, I'm just thinking of a recent example where someone was having a lot of trouble with players not finding the capture point in their map, and they were they were sort of going. Their initial impression was, "Well, I need to add more signs to show them." And if you sit back and go, "Why aren't players seeing this capture point full of signs?" and you investigate why it's because the players were spawning at a specific spot and running towards the middle and that capture point never had to enter their field of vision. So asking why in mapping is a really, really important thing. For sure. And I've said that word so many times now, it's starting to sound <laughs> like weird, but yeah, ask why. And I, I think Everything too, even like when you're like refining detailing down, it's like, why do I have this prop here? Do I need this prop to sell the detailing? That's that's something that I did a lot of on Overgrown, and we did a lot of it on Stony Ridge because we we over detailed those maps, and then we refined it down. And it's it's a really tedious process, and you kind of lose a lot of work that you put into it. But I think it makes a really efficiently detailed, really efficiently made map in the end because you've refined everything down to do I need this specific prop here. Does it sell anything? Is it directing the player's eye? Is there any purpose to this? You know, is is it necessary? And I think that's it's something that's really important. Yeah, definitely. And that also comes into the fact that when you when you make something, um, you can ask, you know, why is this crate here? And then that can direct your detailing in the fact that you might have, you know, a road leading up to it, or, you know, why is this crate here? Maybe it's a shipping area, and then you can add you know, stuff to sell that, like a ship, you know, a dockyard. Yeah, yeah. Stuff like that. So, yeah, ask why. That's that, that's, that's, my, that's my big that's, point. That's a good way to think about that. It's not, that's not really, like, something I've ever thought of, but I do a lot. So, no, oh, that's cool. That's, that's kind of like that's, a... that's my one point of advice from this entire interview. interview. If you take anything away from it, it's ask why for everything you do. <laughs> um, and or, or, or better, a better, better way of saying it is why not. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Why or why not? Yeah. Um, what from a non-mapper perspective now? Uh, what do you think the average player should be expected to know when they're playing TF2 and when they're playing a new map or they're 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 playing in general? Is there is there some kind of expected knowledge that that you feel they should have? Uh, how to move? How to shoot? Oh, well, actually, I mean, like, besides the, the basic, basic things, but, like... Oh, yeah, and this is a very, um, very big, like, topic in game design, is how much you can expect from your players. 
um, yeah, it's a really hard thing to say because I think I expect players at least some level of competence in learning the map and being able to sort of you know, look at a sign and I don't think you should use signs for anything more than telling a player how to first play the map. Um, I, yeah, I personally try to like very rarely use signs until until I start getting complaints of people saying there's no signage. Then I'll start throwing a couple around just to like appease them, but I try to not rely on them at all. You also shouldn't expect your players to change the way they want to play towards your map. Like, I'll, I'll harp on Valve a bit here, but I think Mercenary Park is a big, a big offender in the fact that I don't know. I haven't actually played it in a couple of weeks, but at the first, in the at the first um, few days when every player came out of the forward red spawn, they always went in the wrong direction. Yeah. And I don't think, like, you should expect the players to change their habits of to go in the other direction. I think you should change your map to facilitate the fact that when players go out of a spawn, they tend to go left for some reason. I, I really don't know why, but they always tend to go left. <laughs> Cool. Um, and I found that to be a big thing is that when players come out of the spawn, they tend to go to the left, or at least, if not to the left, towards the most obvious open area or well lit area. And that's a big thing. And you can use that to influence your players a lot. I do think that's actually like, it's, it's a video I've been meaning to make is like tearing apart Mercenary Park because I feel like it makes a lot of mistakes with visual flow and like directing the players to where they need to go and yeah, like, definitely. there's like the blue forward spawn too like it's so easy to backtrack because they point you out and it's like you can choose to go right or left and if you go left that's the way you need to go and if you go right then you're heading back towards your original spawn and the lighting is all to the right and it's dark to the left so like i was doing it repeatedly i'm like i knew i wasn't supposed to go that way but is i still like kept wanting to go that way and i had to like force myself to not go that way coming out of spawn and so yeah i, I did definitely hear that yeah, so I guess what you can expect from your players is that they will play your map in the path of least resistance. They will not think about playing your map, and they shouldn't have to. Um, so you can expect from them to do the dumbest thing that <laughs> is... Yeah, it's funny, but you can. You can expect them to do the dumbest thing, the thing that requires the least amount of effort to achieve their goal. And for most people, that is shooting the enemy. So if they think one route is the shortest to go towards shooting the enemy, then they will take that in most circumstances unless they specifically sit back and think, you know, I need to get a leg up on this situation. It's like, I mean, this is this is not TF2, but I'm just thinking about Overwatch maps. And you, you think, like, the number one thing people complain about um, uh, Temple of Anubis is that the final point is really choky or the... Yeah, well, like the, the first point in High Mirror is that it's really choky. And that's not necessarily true because there is ways you can get around it. In Temple of Anubis, there's multiple ways to attack the points from the side, but people will always take the, the shortest route, the one that requires the least amount of effort, and that's the one that leads straight down to the line of fire, straight to the point. So moving on from that, what do you hate the most about making maps for TF2? Ah, oh, question. Um... <laughs> I hate having to do the like the polished parts and not like, like I mean the polished parts in terms of like um, flipping the map, um, you know, hammering down on optimization and anything that's not cre directly creative. I hate doing the the tedious work. The tedious work, yeah. And like setting setting fade distances on props is like the most boring ass yeah, thing you can ever do. I agree. That's, that's um, always like my one of my last steps, and I always forget to do it as I go. And I'm just like, God damn it! Now I got to sit here and pick all these props apart. And <laughs> I think that's maybe why a lot of the time I leave my maps in like beta three and not get to RC one is because I can get away with not doing the tedious stuff. <laughs> um. So the inverse of that then is, what do you love the most about mapping for TF two? Oh, I mean. Can I say something without being, like, super cheesy? No, go cheese. Full cheese. Let's go. Let's do this. I, I just I just enjoy people 
enjoying my map and saying that they like my map. And that's, you know, the most warm and fuzzy feeling you can get, I think. Yeah, and that's I, what I, I enjoy totally most about mapping. And I, I, and the other thing I most enjoy about mapping is making stuff that people haven't seen before, making really cool environments that people, you know, can sit back and go, wow, that's pretty. And see, I, I don't think there's anything, like, cheesy about saying, like, in, enjoying people enjoying your map. Because that's, like, that's what we're making it for. We're making it for players. We're putting all this time into thinking, how are the players going to think? How are they going to see this? What are they going to notice about this? Um, it's all about the players actually playing the map. So to put to put all these hundreds of hours into a project and finally get it on a server and have people playing it and seeing their reactions and seeing them interacting with the thing you did and having them experience your project like that's that's the best part about mapping for sure yeah definitely i would agree are there any specific limitations when mapping technical or aesthetic wise uh that you try to push the boundaries of and when has it worked out uh technical wise i always try and push how how many you know how low your fps can get before players start complaining <laughs> um, a lot of the time it doesn't work out, um, but I mean, Suijin runs really bad because it's super open and technically wise, making a super open source map is a terrible, terrible idea, but it doesn't stop it, you know, being really popular in terms of, you know, it has 24 seven servers and people play that map for hours on end and you don't necessarily have to worry about getting the highest amount of FPS out of your map, I guess. Um, so that's technical-wise. Was the other half creative-wise? Yeah, technical or, or aesthetic-wise. Like any limitations yes, that you've tried to push. I, I guess aesthetic-wise, that, that's sort of the same thing, because, you know, the more, the, more, the more you push aesthetics, the lower your FPS will get. Um, aesthetic-wise, I guess, I just try to cram as much into a map as possible and try to not do many like shitty boundaries like on Dust Bowl. I was looking at Dust Bowl the other day and I mean I guess no one notices so it doesn't really matter but personally I, I, I care about this and that's the fact that um on the third stage to the left of the first point um the skybox starts like 500 units in and even in the the map itself the, there's no displacements like the cliffs are made out of brushes and it looks terrible <laughs> i guess i'm always trying to push push like you know how how much you can detail i guess is the answer to that one are there uh, this might be one of those kind of things you don't necessarily want to say yet but are there any uh, unusual mapping features or layout ideas you have in mind for future maps that you want to use eventually? Do they have any like kind of ideas brewing? Oh, there's a few. I I really want to make. There has been one map that has done this before, but I think the idea is hilarious and I really want to do it. And that's a payload race map. It's a giant circle, and you win by pushing your cart into the back of the others. Oh yeah. Other teams. I really want to do that. Um. I also really want to do that. Can I talk about like aesthetic themes that I really yeah, still yeah. want to do? Um, really want to do a Tibet Nepal theme. That's sort of, I mean, I have a map for that. I just haven't got around to doing it yet. I really want to do snowy Japan at some point. And I just haven't found a map to do it with yet. Yeah, I guess those are, those are the main ones that I can think of right now. Um, I know you do some modeling. Um, do you have any suggestions for someone trying to start off getting into that? And like, what program do you use? I use 3ds Max, which you don't have to use and you probably shouldn't because it is expensive as crap and it's like $2,000 a year or something just to use it and it's not worth that price. So use Blender um, if you can. I haven't learned it yet. I really want to just be so I can move over to using Blender and stop having to be at the whims of 3ds Max. 3ds Max is ridiculous pricing. Um, there are plenty of good tutorials out there. You can, uh, you know, you can Google 
any of them. Um, in terms of 3ds Max, Top Hat Waffle actually, you know, the guy that makes all the hammer tutorials, he actually has a good series on learning 3ds Max, and I quite I think it's quite good, especially considering he's coming at it from the perspective of a source mapper. Um, so that's really helpful. Yeah, I, I uh, watch. I've watched plenty of his. Texturing, Photoshop, um, for TF2, it's all, really all you can use. I guess you can use GIMP. Um, I never use GIMP. I don't know how bad or good it is, but most people use Photoshop, and it's not that expensive these days. It's only like twelve dollars a month or something. Um, I don't know what happens if you stop subscribing to it. I think you might still be able to use it. I'm not sure, but yeah, you can. You can. You don't have to pay four thousand dollars for Photoshop anymore. So. Yeah, that helps. <laughs> um, I, guess, I guess you kind of answered this one uh, already, but uh, do you typically start with the layout or the theme in mind when you like first are working on a map? Uh, definitely the theme. I think as every single map I have ever done is definitely the theme. Like you still I do a, the this. usual like dev texture blockouts, but you just kind of have that theme yes, in mind. Yes, but I'm always I'm always doing my blockouts with a thought or thought to what the area will be when it's fully detailed and of course that doesn't necessarily always pan out like a lot of the time i'll delete areas and change it to something else but i will always block out buildings in a way that i think will make sense once it's detailed and obviously that leads to having things like you know putting uh, a station next to a train track for tn for example and um if you're just blocking out and you go oh i think a train here would be really cool. You might not necessarily think, um, well, you know, a train needs a station. The train needs, you know, boom gates. I think that's a, actually that's not a really Australian term, isn't it? The things that yeah. come down <laughs> to block your car from going across the train tracks. We call them boom gates in Australia. They they gates and they boom, I guess. Hmm. Um, so yeah, I, yeah. The theme always the theme always drives my layouts. The, I always think of the theme first. I always think of what theme I want to do. What visuals I want to achieve like if sometimes it's an area that I want to um achieve like in sulfur um even when it was still the volcano -y idea I definitely wanted the final point to be sort of like a, a super villainy lair kind of um in terms of like you know a huge room with bubbling lava slash water at the bottom yeah okay um well i think then that is about it uh is there anything you want to plug uh twitter or anything like that or workshop ah uh, yeah go follow me on the workshop like my mats um a few there that haven't been officialized yet like sulfur i mean you know that would be nice wouldn't it um uh my twitter is at freya design i don't remember if it's got an underscore or not it um, does freya yes, underscore it does. design <laughs> Crash, Crash can put that in the description of the yep, video. Yeah, yeah. If you check the description, there's well a, a link to my workshop. Um, yeah, you can you can reach me on Twitter, um, TFT Maps, Discord. I'm always in the TFT Maps Discord and Crash's Discord, and I'm in the the TF2 Emporium Discord as well. But I'm not too active in that one. Yeah, um, I guess that's it. Okay. If you well. have, yeah. If you have a level design or environment design job that you want to give me, totally hit me up. I'm really looking for a job right now. Yeah, she's really good and needs a job, so hire her. <laughs> okay, well, I appreciate you taking your time and answering lots of questions and rambling for me. So uh, mm. I think that'll about end it. Cool. See you later. <laughs>